Well, let's go we'll start going. If everybody please rise, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, good evening, everyone. It's a beautiful day out there for November. Um, remember, as we go through our agenda tonight, please keep in mind our mission and our vision statements as we make, make decisions throughout the agenda. So um, I'd like to thank Seth Garland tonight for being our video man, our person today so we can, uh, everybody can see us. Uh, look to call the meeting uh, to order here, and uh, we do have a, we have an, uh, what do I want to call it? Quorum. Thank you. Thanks for the help. <laughs> Hearing of delegations, we have none. Uh, we need a motion then to approve the agenda, and I don't believe there's been any changes. No. So moved. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, we have a second. Second. Thanks, Brent. We have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Agenda approved. Uh, moving into communications to the board, and tonight we have some of the best dressed individuals we'll that usually come to the board member or meetings. And uh, we have our FFA uh, members going to talk about their national convention trip. Well, thank you for giving us the opportunity. My name is Betsy Becker. I'm the Agricultural Education and FFA Advisor here at Algona High School. Uh, in uh, October 30th, 30th, we traveled down to uh, Indianapolis with North Iowa, FFA chapters, North Union, and we also added Iowa Valley this year out of Marengo. Uh, we we changed things up a little bit. Uh, we toured. Uh, we took a day and toured down in in Louisville, Kentucky, on Wednesday, and so we, uh, we caught a couple different tours. And the kids will be talking about that. And then I'll finish up with some uh, details from the year that we've done so far. So I believe Paige is up first. My name is Paige Villata, and I'm a senior. So the first tour that we took was to the Louisville Slugger Museum, and the actual like Louisville Slugger production started in 1884 when they started making bats for professional baseball players. The there's only a couple requirements for a uh, uh, tray to become a like into a good bat, and that is for the tray to be roughly 65 years old and it to be perfectly straight. And then it they can get around 60 billets per tree, which is the billet actually turns into the bat. It's just like the before before the bat. And then fewer than 15% of the billets actually get made into MLB bats. And then there are three different um, types of wood that they make the bats out of, which is maple, which is the hardest and more dense. Oak bats become more flexible and stronger the more that you use them. And then ash bats are the most flexible, but then they're trying to find an alternative because of the emerald ash borer problem. And then it takes 45 or 48 seconds to turn an actual bat. So they turn it from the billets to the actual bat. And then 85% of the bats are made from wood, uh, maple trees. And then the grain of the wood and how they, um, which grain they put forth actually makes a difference on how strong the bat can be, can turn into. And then um, major league players often order almost 100 bats per their seasons. And then we had a great time at this museum and coming from a softball player, it was awesome to see the museum. And my dad has actually been here three times. And so to go for my first time was pretty cool. And then um, at the end of the tour, we actually got to take home a little mini bat as a souvenir. So that was pretty cool as well. We get six bats per tree. 65 year old tree, 60, six, <coughs> six bats. Six, no, 60. 60, but they only 15% make it oh, to. Oh, yeah. That's quality. Okay, so my name is Kara Roder, and I'm a junior. So Churchill Downs uh, is one of the racetracks in the Triple Crown. The track is 1.25 miles in length, and the Kentucky Derby is always run on the first Saturday in May. Out of the whole, out of like the history of the race, only three uh, fillies have won, which is a female horse. Um, at the Kentucky Derby, there are 150,000 people in attendance. That is including the stands and the infield. Um, the horse secretariat holds uh, records at all three Triple Crown tracks. The track has four distinct turns and two straightaways, and has been unchanged since the facility opened in 1909. Uh, and we were fortunate enough to be able to see like one race happen as we were there. Okay, and then for our first general session, was which was basically the thing that the 
kicked off our convention. So we had the pleasure of hearing from our keynote speaker, Juan Bendana, and the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack. And to start off, the Secretary of Agriculture gave his um, remarks on behalf of the Biden administration, and then he was awarded and presented his honorary American degree for five years and of his Secretary of Agriculture position. And then our keynote speaker main ideas was from Juan. He told us that we all have things that make get in the way of being our confident selves. Great ideas are just ideas, but they also require action to actually become something. And then we don't need to try and please people whose opinions do not matter. And then one um, quote that I really took away from his was strive for progress and not perfection. And then there was one story that really resonated with us from Juan, and that was the story of Pepe. Um, Juan was on a vacation to uh, somewhere where he went horseback riding, and all of his family got regular horses, and he got a pony to ride. So they were on this trail, and Juan came upon a snake in the pathway with his pony, and Pepe, his pony, immediately stopped and like didn't do anything and stood his ground for, to the snake and waited. And then the snake just slithered away, not caring about the animal that was 10 times bigger than him. So we learned that to be like Pepe and stand our ground in conflict instead of backing down. Hello, my name is Carly Allen. I'm a senior at Algona High School and I'm also the treasurer of the Algona FFA. Um, so me and Paige had the privilege to walk across the national <coughs> FFA stage. Um, to receive the National Chapter Award. Um, it is designed to recognize FFA chapters that are act actively implement the missions and strategies of the organization. In order to qualify for a state or national award, your chapter must complete at least 15 activities. One for each of the five quality standards in each of the three divisions. Additionally, the chapter must meet the minimum requirements as outlined in the National Quality Chapter Standards. Chapters are rewarded for providing educational experiences for the entire membership. Chapters that receive a gold rating by their state FFA associations are eligible to compete for the national FFA three-star, two-star, and one-star ratings. We received the two-star rating this year. Hello, my name is Diedrich Schneiders. Uh, I'm in ninth grade and uh, we went to the rodeo. Uh, there were two teams, the Team Dodge that were blue shirt riders and Team Renegade that were red shirt riders. Uh, the comm was entertaining as well as his role to keep the riders safe. And the three stuff we watched were saddle bronc, uh, barback, and bull riding. A uh, top rider from each team competed against each other in the final round. Uh, we were on the team dodge, and at the end, our riders won the rodeo. Hello, my name is Tucker Brunswald. In my, work in my workshop, Know Your Worth and Getting to Where You Want to Go, we learned how to communicate to new people, in getting to where you want to go, we learned how to write a resume and get a new job using the STAR method. Situation, task, action, and result. In Know Your Worth, we learned how to talk to new people without being scared because the person you are talking to is probably just about as scared as you. These are some of the things I have learned in the workshops from FFA Convention. I'm Hannah Perez. I'm a freshman here at Algona High. And one of the workshops I went to was the U.S. Army Veterinarian Camp career. And the veterinarian program all started with the Revolutionary War. And in World War I, the Army animals expanded to dogs, horses, camels, pigeons, dolphins, and more. So the veterans, they normally do just pre preventative and routine care, emergency trauma care, kennel inspections, feral animal, animal control, and rabbit control and their dolphins actually detect underwater bombs and foreign divers in our water. And being a veteran in the Army has many bonuses, such as full medical and dental plan and care, low-cost life insurance, a retirement plan, 30 days of paid vacation, and more. <coughs> Hi, 
Hi, I'm Melissa Engel, and I went to a workshop called Leadership is Influence. Um, first, we watched a social experiment video where a guy was wearing a uniform, and he asked people to help him. And nine out of ten time, nine out of the ten people complied. But when he changed into into street clothes, everyone walked right on by. So that shows that appearing confident or authoritative makes a better chance for your audience to listen to you. We also learned five rules in influence. Um, at the bottom, they put it in a pyramid. At the bottom is the authoritarian, um, a person who takes control and enforces obedience. The friend, the person to include you into the conversation. Next is the coach, the encouraging person to guide you. The mentor, to teach and guide you towards your strengths. And the Jedi, you want to mirror their confidence and they are the most influential. We also learned two types of influence, which transactional transactional influence, it's like a you do something for me, I do something for you kind of situation, and that's it. And a transformational influence is like you're a family and you support each other. Okay, so um, FFA members were had the chance to tour the career and college fair. So it's basically like four of our high school gyms and it's packed full with different colleges and businesses, just trying to get more people to learn about what they have to offer there. Um, so you, I was able to talk to many different colleges and see what programs they had to offer, as well as meet with like Case IH and other um, like right into workplace experiences as well. So you can see that uh, uh, we're missing a few students tonight due to illness and other things. Uh, they weren't able to be here. But uh, while we're there, we keep them very engaged, uh, not only with uh, agriculture, but also with uh, career and college readiness. Uh, <coughs> we took five freshmen, and, and uh, four of them were here tonight. So uh, it's, it, it's not easy to do what they just did, uh, especially talking in front of people that they don't know well. So uh, we, we work on those employability skills uh, every day in class. Next year, the uh, convention's going to be a week earlier. It's going to be back on schedule again. It'll be the 23rd to the 26th back in Indianapolis. In fact, it'll be there uh, through 30, uh, 2031. So it's going to be there for uh, a bit. We do appreciate you allowing us to go to convention, allowing us uh, to take time away from the classroom. I think the things that they pick up uh, on these trips are just as valuable in different ways. Um, seeing them interact with other students. Uh, we had an interaction where we were uh, between tours in Louisville and uh, we were uh, kind of checking out to pay for our meal and this uh, older couple came up to me and she says, I just want to comment on the table of girls that you had there, uh, students, and how well they uh, interacted, they, they talked to us. We didn't know them, and I, so I, when I got on the bus, I went, all right, which of you had this opportunity to talk to this couple? And, and uh, uh, Carly goes, it was me. No, oh, Paige. Paige. Sorry, Paige, sorry. Uh, and, but she said they were really nice people, and uh, they, they were just talking, and, and she started the conversation with them. So if you think about it, we're in a different state in, a, in an area that nobody knows us. Maybe it's easier, maybe it's not, but they still do the, they still do the right things even when we're away from, from the uh, campus here at Lagona. So I just wanted to let you know that uh, it's important that they do the right thing and, and uh, have the respect and integrity regardless of what we uh, have on uh, and where we're at. Um, a couple updates from the Ag Department that I'm going to share with you real quickly. In 2023, it was, it's been a pretty busy year. We had uh, uh, eight FFA uh, Iowa degree recipients. Uh, we had a couple students at the State Leadership Conference do the uh, freshman quiz. Uh, Jaden Spear was the uh, runner-up in the proficiency of small animals. She was also a star in agribusiness uh, with her Iowa degree, uh, with uh, her, her SAE of, of uh, dog grooming. Our farm business management team got a gold. Our team ag sales uh, team was a silver. A poultry contest was a silver. And then our en Envirothon, we were the third place FFA team about three points from qualifying for a national event again. So it wasn't too bad um, for that. Uh, coming up, uh, we had the, the Iowa State Fair and the Kasuth County Fair. Our district soils team in the fall, uh, we won the, uh, the district contest, went to state and finished 15th in the state. And then we've got some opportunities for some winter livestock judging, which they're, and all of these uh, CDEs or career development events, they're improving their uh, reasoning, their critical thinking skills. And a lot of these contests are on Saturdays, so they're giving up time to do this. So uh, I have to say that it's, it's pretty good on their part to, to represent themselves and the school very well. 
Uh, the next slide kind of talks about, and you really can't see it well, I'll just tell you some things. Uh, we have about 98 members in the uh, FFA chapter, whether they're in, in school or out of school. We keep them active in case those out of school members want to do their American degree. Uh, of the 75 in-school members, we had 106 projects. We totaled 8,800 8, SAE hours. Now these SAEs, you might know them better as work-based learning, if that resonates a little better for you. Uh, 8,826 uh, hours that they journaled. We did 441 contest hours this last year, 62 contest activities. Our SAE income thus far is 37,000, but uh, the kids are actively entering their hours from the fall, getting caught up. Uh, last year, our income was 110, almost $111,000. Economic input, this is going back to the community with $71,526. The value that these kids are doing and giving back to the community with their community service and everything they own. So uh, it's significant what they're doing and, and how they're doing it. The last thing I have for you is what questions do you have for myself or the FFA members? I don't know if it's a question, but it's always great to hear. I know you go to Indianapolis and a lot of the same tours, but I always seem to hear something a little bit different about it that they take away. We, and we try and find different trips for them so that way they don't see the same thing. Uh, I've seen the Indianapolis Motor Speedway probably a dozen times, yeah. but that's okay. Uh, they, for these guys to, to keep it fresh, next year we'll probably be touring back in the Indianapolis area just because uh, if there's any carryover, then it's new tours for them. Mm -hmm. yep. How many times have you guys been? I've been twice. 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 Once. And how many total did you say you took? We, this we year? took nine this year. Nine? Any other questions? Wonderful presentation. Yeah, guys. Great job. Yeah. Thank you. Great job. Thank, Thank you. you. You bet. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. We'll continue to move on then. Uh, our next uh, I item is the consent items. You probably should have all received them in your packets. I know Lisa put also some additional invoices in front of you. Um, was there any questions about the consent items? Or Joe, you have any comments? Yeah, there's. I'm going to, you know, there's, there's lots of great information in there. I'm going to kind of you know, highlight three reports that I think are important to uh, closely look at each month. Um, the first one is the monthly uh, ending fund balances. Um, you know, always valuable to review that report to see um, our specific accounts. Um, you know, for example, the uh, insurance fund uh, right here. Um, in 2019, uh, when I started, we were about 500000 in this in this fund, um, we want to make sure we have enough in there. We have more than enough, um, and that, that helps us make decisions on our our insurance on, on an annual basis. But we've had some great years in there that's led us to that. Um, you know, our save. This is our, our revenue uh, revenue bonds will will come from the save fund, which is the one cent sales tax, um, Pebble, um, which is some property funds. So just looking at those. On a, on a month to month basis. The second one is the revenue and expenses. So if you look at uh, um, for October uh, 22, 23, our expenses were uh, 1.6 million. They're, they're higher now. We would expect our expenses to go up as salaries increases unless we have uh, less staffing. Um, but our revenues are also up. Um, so the, just to compare those two things, uh, I think is important. Uh, you'll see that uh, our Laverne accounts are merged into these dollars. Um, actually, right here is what we're looking at. Um, in, in October, which changed our totals quite a bit from the, the totals in September. Always, you know, we want our, our revenues to exceed our expenses as they, they do in this total. Although we, we know in this school year, um, our expenses will exceed our revenues. We can predict that, and that, that's mostly due to our, our certified number, which I'll go through in my report, uh, is higher this year, but we get that money next year. Um, but uh, we, that's not a problem. Um, and this last one, the cash and bank, is a good example of why, is that uh, we have a strong fund balance. Um, you know, it's over, over 4.5 million right here. 
Uh, that's with the Laverne Cash added. You can see that in comparison. Last month I talked about that, that balance, how it was um, significantly smaller from the year before, and that's just we lost ESSER, ESSER dollars for the first time in, in 36 months. So um, we're, we're very, very uh, healthy in those reports. So those, those are three reports I think um, um, you can look at every month that, that help us kind of gauge our, our financial health and how we're doing. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, we need a motion then to approve the consent item. Second. Thanks, Andrea. Do we have a second? Second, second. the motion. Thanks, Tom. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Consent items approved. <coughs> Joe, I guess we'll come back to you and go right into the superintendent's yes. report. Superintendent report, uh, certified enrollment. Um, you know, October 1st is the is the date that you, you count students, but uh, it's a couple week process before you're actually certified in that enrollment. So uh, reviewing that um, in comparison to last year, our certified enrollment is up over 104 students. <coughs> uh, that's due to the reorganization with Laverne. Um, that number is very, very important to us. Is that That is the number uh, that provides our per pupil funding for the 2024-2025 school year next year. Overall, we actually have um, a little over seven fewer students in our buildings, in our classrooms, than we did the previous year, although our funding number is much, much higher. I would anticipate that our, our enrollment will drop um, the next two years. We'll graduate a class of 119 and 130. Oh, you know, we won't have kindergarten numbers that are that big. So we'll, we will see an enrollment drop um, the next two years. A new line appears in certified enrollment um, this year that hasn't before, um, where the number of students who live in your district that are funded by an educational savings account. We have 146 resident students who are funded by an educational savings account and attend a private school. Um, this year, any student enrolled in a public school, uh, the previous year who attends non-public um, and whose family has a household of income of 300% of the federal poverty guidelines were eligible. Next year, that number grows to 400 so where we have 146 this year, that will grow next year. There are no guidelines in the third year, so that 146 number will, um, will continue to grow. That's significant for us as we receive categorical funding for all of those students. Uh, categories like TAG, um, TLC funding, um, professional development. In, in total, um, the categoricals equal about $1,200 per pupil. So $1,200 times however many kids are receiving those ESAs this year, it's 146 is, is new funding for us. So comparing our certified so enrollment. So how, how do you anticipate our enrollment changing based on the change for? We had, there's five students who attended Algona schools last year who attend Garrigan this year. So not relatively low. I wouldn't anticipate there be a lot of change. Is there, with those educational savings accounts, is it, though it has to be an accredited school, correct? It can't be used towards yep. anything else other than an accredited school. Correct, yeah. And there's a lot of private schools that would not be accredited, like smaller. There are, um, our local ones are, but there yep. certainly are um, private schools that aren't accredited. Yeah. But you don't anticipate it affecting our enrollment much. You know, I mean, it, time it, will tell. But time will tell. Year one, you know, the, this question was asked a lot last year um, during the legislative session. Um, administratively, we talked about it. We did not anticipate um, a large change, and we didn't see a large change. I mean, do we see that historically between our school and Garrigan, where it goes back and forth? I mean, because I've I've seen kids that'll be. Garrigan kids that'll move towards yeah. Algona just for different needs and vice versa. But I would I would agree with you. Um, I would say having five students who attend Garrigan this year that attended us last year that that would not be abnormal from a normal year. Um, same thing, you know, with some students. Because we could pick up five next year. Good, that, It just depends. Yeah. Okay. So time will tell, but we did not see a change, um, drastic change this year. Some of our certified comparisons, the resident kids uh, attending our district 
um, up 85, that's up over 120 over the last three years. The actual enrollment, this is your certified number, this is the big one, um, that's up 104 and, and up um, over 129 over the last three years. I put in red here, we have 119 seniors and 130 juniors, just to, to show I would anticipate this number going down um, the next two school years. Our open enrolled in went from um, went down from 154 to 119. That that's about negative 35 is about the number of students who we previously had open enrolled in from Laverne. So those are now resident kids. Uh, so we anticipated that number going down. Um, tuition in so none on that whole grade share. We had 53. Uh, we have zero now as those are now resident students. Our pre-K-4 students attending uh, statewide voluntary preschool, it's up uh, nine. I know Mr. Sue and I were just talking about this morning, I think we have 87 four-year-olds in our preschool program. Um, you know, the, these are not, this is the funding number, um, not the uh, um, number of students. Um, I do believe there will be a legislative push to fully fund preschool. Um, I met with uh, Representative Stone last uh, Wednesday. That's certainly one of his initiatives uh, for this year. Uh, total school age students in the district. This is, you know, this is our actual kids. We're we're down, um, and I would I would anticipate that number going down the next two years because of the large graduating class sizes. Yes, yes. Our our uh, preschool kindergarten numbers they they are not smaller than what we have had. We just had some areas of you know juniors and seniors. Um, second and third, you know, where we have some bubbles of, of kids, and that, that's just what we'll always have in a rural district. Last uh, piece I want to talk about is a classified staff early retirement program. Um, previous month, uh, you, the, the board passed an early retirement program for our, our, our teachers uh, with the intentions of having that in place for, for four years. The last time we did that in 2021, um, we passed an early retirement program for classified staff as well. In 2021, when we did that, uh, to be eligible for the program, a, a person had 25 years of full-time service in the district. Um, the benefit that was provided was 25% of their previous year earnings plus $25 per unused sick day. Uh, we have 10 current staff members who would be eligible this year, um, replacing all 10 of those with an entry-level wage for that, their positions uh, would have a savings of possibly about $80,000. Uh, the one-time cost of the program would be about $122,000. Um, if, if the board is interested in this type of program, I could um, bring, I would recommend a cap of five years. Um, we talk a lot about the teacher shortage, which certainly uh, impacts our ability to hire, but there's a labor shortage just in general, too. Um, so having 10 of those positions gone in a year, I think would be very, very difficult for us. So I would certainly recommend a cap in this also. Um, I could bring back a proposal in December if the board was interested, but wanted to give you guys the opportunity to have that discussion today. How many staff people did it say that we would, uh, or we have 10? 10. 10, 10 are eligible. eligible. Okay. Yeah. Just this year? You're this year. This, this year. year. And. We would cap it at five per year. Yes. Well, well that's that's what I would yeah. recommend if mm -hmm. you were interested. The entry level wage is thirteen. Is that where we're at, or we're thirteen for an associate, um, fifteen for maintenance, um, secretary. Uh, yeah, it's probably closer to fifteen. Um, I just in my mind thinking, are we, you know, what would be a higher back at that entry level wage? It, which we, it's where we set it, so yeah. I understand that, but filling the roles at that entry level wage, too. I always get confused. Classified is non teachers. Correct. And this is a new, because we didn't talk about this before. We, we didn't. Were not. We didn't. The, we, teachers, we, we've done. Yeah. This would be classified not non teachers. When we did this uh, previously, um, we used some qualifications of 25 years of full time service in the district. Um, and then, you know, the same formula of 1% of their previous year multiplied by years of service, so it would be 25 for all of So them. what's the change, because when we had talked about the unclassified, 
Is that right? Am I using certified. 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 There was concern about this, and we decided kind of briefly that we weren't going to do it because we didn't think there would be a cost savings. Right. But Not now. substantial. Yeah. And, you know, the, the cost savings of, of replacing them, you know, would be 80000 one-time cost to do this would be 122000 So nothing's changed with that. Those are not the same funds, though. I will, will say that. So it would, it, would cost, it would cost us $42,000 to do this program? Yes. Although it's not the same funds. That's just a dollar-for-dollar dollar comparison. And that's because we would pay the, the benefit, the 122000 out of management. Out of management. This would be a general funds savings. When it comes down to this, is like a thank you for... Years of service. Yeah, you know, um, you know, we we pay into IPERS yeah. for all of our employees yeah. at nine and a half percent, nine point four four percent. And so the district is always contributing mm -hmm. towards the retirement of our employees. Uh, then the employees also have a contribution of around six percent. Okay. Um, so they're it, people who leave here whether we have a program in place or not have a retirement benefit that the district contributes to. Mm -hmm. um, this would be in addition to that. And when we offered early retirement last time, this is what we did. This is what we did. This is the... And the thought process back then was, was I agree, I mean, the reason why we do it for the teachers, right, is for our budget. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a cost, cost savings. savings. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and and when we did it the last time for uh, the classified staff, it was around kind of that thank you okay. for your service of 25 and your commitment to the district. Um, so, I mean, I think we, we got to look at this too of uh, the longevity, you know, um, potentially. Of, of, you know, is this something that we want to think about and continue to do or say? I think Andrea brings up if um, if you wanted to consider um, you know, these are people who, who have classified people who've worked in the district for 25 years, a very long time, very long time. And we are very appreciative of, of those people. Um, there's people on the list who are at 40, a um, number of them in the 30s. So these are people who have committed uh, themselves to the district. We are not paying. Health insurance. No, not as part of this. No. And we did before. Um, I remember one of the last times we talked about this. You know, part of the conversation was, you know, instead of rewarding them when they retire, let's try to increase their wages so that, you know, hey, thanks. And my concern is that that's getting harder and harder to do with the state funding not being where I feel it should be, you know, and, and stuff. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of this. And I, one thing, the, the only downside I see in, in something like this is we do it here, we do it a few years later, we might do it if, you know, a few whatever. And it kind of, and I'm using the word forces out, and I don't really like that word, but people think, hey, I'm going to take advantage of this, and they maybe retire before they're ready to retire. I can think we have one special ed teacher who took advantage of the early retirement a few years back and she's back in the classroom now. You know, I mean, she just wasn't ready to retire, but hey, it's a great opportunity. I'm going to take, take advantage of it. What, is there downside or something that this is just something that we have in place continually so that, you know, when somebody reaches that 25 years or when they're ready to retire, um, you know, because I, I think of some of the people you know, I, I don't know for sure, but some of the people I think might be, could be eligible for this. I mean, I'd hate to lose a couple, three of those all at the same time. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think primarily, you know, the custodial staff, you know what I mean? And, and um, you know, if we lose a couple of those at the same time, it might be, yeah. I, I don't know. So I just, an idea I had, I just wanted to throw it out there about just kind of. I think a couple of points, Todd, and I think you're exactly right, first of all. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we increased uh, both our food service and our associates' wages during the school year and then negotiated another one. So two, two raises in a year for those people. Um, and I, that, that was part of us trying to work on those numbers and work on those salaries. Um, so, so we have, the, the board has done that, uh, as you mentioned. Second thing, this benefit is different um, 
than when we offered insurance for the teachers. Uh, there's no insurance option here. So it would be difficult for many people to take advantage of this prior to the age of 65. Um, unless they had another option for health insurance or, or just wanted to pay into ours. Um, so I don't, that, that example, where, and we've had that, he gave, he gave an example of a teacher who retires early because the insurance benefit's too good not to take. This doesn't have that. So I think in many cases of our employees, um, they would probably wait closer to 65. Also, um, you know, Lisa and I are working on some of this. Being older than 65, you are not eligible for early retirement program by Iowa Code. Um, so that <coughs> something to consider as well. Because you're no longer early. Right, I didn't realize that. Yeah. I'm, in, I'm in favor of rewarding people for their service, but I don't want to also get to setting the precedent where every time that we come, we are expected to have have a program for for everyone because we might be in a situation where financially or is it our, in our best option to to do these programs so I you know I'd be in favor of tabling it or thinking about it some more to quite understand yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're not voting, but I have the same feelings as Jay. I don't know. I think it's going to take a little while to process. I'd like to talk just a little bit more about it. But, yeah, I, I, the, what is it, certified staff, we do that because it saves it. We have to do it. Yes. I mean, it's not a matter of. It's a financial. It's a financial decision purely. Yeah. And to do this every time we do something like that in the future five years down the road for yeah. the classified staff is a. But I also want to. We also. I also want to award employees or encourage employees to stay here in longevity when they can also go get a job at Pharmacist Mutual or any of these places and make substantially more. So, like the management fund. So I mean, yes, it's saving eighty thousand dollars out of general fund, which pays salaries, and you can do anything with general fund money. But it's costing us out of the management fund. Management fund is also what we use for. The early retirement for the teachers or the certified staff. So I mean, it's affecting potentially that down the road too. What else do we pay out of management fund? Property insurance. Property insurance, which All is that liability insurance. Well, close to half million dollars. Um, yeah, I mean, do we always have a surplus in management? Mm -hmm. no. Unless we levy. Unless we. Yeah, you levy. Know, it's not that we levy our, our management. You know, this is where it's at currently, but you know we're spending out of it. Yeah. Um, we. So at the end of the day, I mean, it's tax. It is. Payer, we levied one point three million dollars on mansion this year, um, which is a, a big number. But that was the anticipation of the early retirement. Well, I, you know, I know why we do the teachers so early because obviously we want to hire early as possible. Yeah. Um, but the ones that we hire there are looking for jobs starting next year. A lot of times, where here I do. I don't think there's a harm in waiting and tabling it for a month because we're not going to be able to replace, hire somebody now and say, okay, well, you're not going to start till next August. Right. So right. we still have time to we have, make. We would have a deadline. You have to, um, to use management to pay early retirement. Um, the application has to be approved before April 1st. Okay. So we would probably need it approved to give them, I think um, by law, we have to give them 55 days to make a decision. Um, so probably January we would have to approve to give them enough days to make a decision to be accepted before April 1st. Do you so need a motion? I would I would motion to. No, no, no motion. motion. This is just a discussion. Um, and, and we can leave it right where it is right now. And uh, Roger can talk to me about if um, we want it as an agenda item in December or if we're more comfortable um, learning more and waiting until January. Well, that's, what I, that's what I was going to motion. Yeah, I think I we have to continue to talk about it even if we're going to motion or do something in January or okay. whatever. I, I think it's something to go <coughs> back to revisit a little bit. Um, is five too many? Is three enough? I mean, I don't know how, what the labor shortage 
Yeah, yeah, we, you know, but all that can be thought about a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. The projections you guys have built out have got the uh, teachers right modeled out through 2018. Can we, can we model this out? Yeah, I could put this in the forecast tool also. Um, That's a good idea. You know, I could subtract those 10 out over whatever four years and then you know see what, what that does. And I don't know, just just like we talked about the teachers too, right? And I get your point with Todd's of it's not necessarily as much of a timing thing maybe, but also, you know, if we've got, it sounds like we've got handful uh, on the custodial side and in, do we have other people, you know, where like if we did lose three, four, five people in this one area, gosh, that would be a kind of a hardship. So anyway, I mean, maybe something to, to think about as yeah. well as we look By department. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right, good discussion. Any more for third time? All right, then we'll uh, move on to administrative reports. Um, Joe, you didn't have any more, right? No, nope, that's okay. it. Sorry about that. Uh, administrative report, we have elementary admin here, Mrs. Schucher and Mr. Sudol, to talk about the importance of a content-rich curriculum. All right, so we are here to talk about the importance of content-rich curriculum. We are in our second year of our core knowledge language arts curriculum. Um, which we feel has a deep, um, you know, content-rich curriculum. And they would know that acronym because um, they they approved that. So CKLA, CKLA. yes. The, um, the what we approved a few years ago as our new language arts curriculum. And, uh, Mr. Sudal used that acronym correctly there, which is awesome. Yeah. I don't know what I would have. yeah. All right. The next slide there. So uh, the simple VO reading has the formula up there: word recognition times language. Language comprehension equals reading comprehension. So word recognition, word recognition includes pho phonological awareness, phonics, how to blend sounds to read words, decoding. Um, these things are all explicitly taught in our CKLA curriculum. And we'll talk about the time frame later on when we do that and how long we do that. Uh, language comprehension has background knowledge, includes vocabulary, language structure, verbal reasoning, and literacy knowledge. Um, those two things, I think the most important thing to remember up there is that multiplication symbol. One times one equals one, which is a reading comprehension. Like 0.5 a word recognition times one a language comprehension does not equal one. So I think that's the most important thing to remember when we talk about uh, reading comprehension today. Okay, so I'd like you just to read this in your head to yourself. A little reading practice tonight. You can give me a thumbs up in front of your chest when you're finished, like we do with our students. Okay. You having um, second graders read that? What's that? Are you having second graders read that? You know what, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Carter, will you flip to the next one? We'll tell you, we'll tell you the reading yeah. level okay. later. Yeah, will you read this one to yourself? All right, so between the two, which one, I mean, anyone want to tell me what the second one was about? This one that we have up right now, what's it about? Baseball. A baseball game. Can you kind of like see it happening? The batter hits, but he, it gets on base kind of. Um, how about the first paragraph? Does anyone know what was happening in that first paragraph? Sounds like pirates. What's that? Pirates. Oh. This is actually um, from a British newspaper about the game of cricket. And that, my only hint would have been the ninth Wait, wicket. No. Some people <laughs> maybe played cricket in PE, maybe, or if you've watched a cricket match, but it's not very familiar to us. We don't have a lot of knowledge about the game of cricket, where the game of baseball is more familiar to us. So when we read that, we could understand or visualize what had happened. So um, on the this slide here, um, researchers have done, it's an important, uh, they often refer to it as the baseball study.
they had four different types of readers read the same article about baseball. Kids who knew about baseball who were strong readers, kids who knew about baseball who were weak readers, kids who didn't know about baseball who were strong readers, and kids who didn't know about baseball and weren't great readers. And you can see that the kids who knew a lot about baseball and were strong readers did the best. And the kids that knew a lot about baseball but weren't the best readers did the second best. So having knowledge about a topic does help. So the researchers gave them all the same article and then asked them comprehension questions. And those students who knew about baseball but didn't maybe weren't the best readers still performed better than other students who were stronger readers than they were because they had knowledge about the topic. And they re, I think this first study maybe would have been in the 80s or something, I can't remember for sure. But they found the same results so many times they basically stopped um, researching on the topic because it just, there's no point in doing it anymore because it's, it's just a fact that if you know something more about it, you're more li likely to understand when you read about it. Which talks about really in this next slide why knowledge is so important. Um, studies have consistently shown with the greater amount of background knowledge, you know the stronger reading comprehension, comprehension you have. So then a child with lower reading skill can partially compensate having a higher degree of background knowledge. Um, so in CKLA, what we do right now, kindergarten through second grade have one hour of skills. That'd be that word recognition part of the formula that where they learn to like know letter sounds and um, phonemic awareness and blend letters to make words and all of that. And then they have one hour of knowledge. And this is where they learn about different topics um, in just about all different things. I just taught a third grade lesson and I was like, oh gosh, I, I remember learning this one time about our brain and t um, about the cerebrum and cerebellum and medulla and the different parts of the brain. Today, um, in a lesson I observed, they were learning about all the body systems and how they are interconnected was one of their vocabulary words and how a swimmer, for example, the kids had to find out what ones, parts of their body systems would they be using that they learned about. The skeletal, skeletal system, the muscular system, and the nervous system, and so the kids had to explain that. Um, so that's some of the things they learn in knowledge, and we'll talk more about that. Third grade, they don't have skills and knowledge separated as much. Um, there's different parts of the lessons that work on word recognition and on the um, language comprehension pieces with the vocabulary and all that. And then in fourth grade, it goes down to 90 minutes of that combined. It's not two separate distinct times. It's all just kind of at one time. But all grades incorporate both parts of that simple view of reading formula. As we talked about the read alouds during our knowledge time focuses on the oral, oral language development, the vocabulary, the questions that's asked during that, um, the discussions they have during that as well too. Um, I think the most important thing to know about it too is, you know, we want to recall that memory from that knowledge. So a lot of our topics build upon each other. Um, so for example, in kindergarten, they're talking about the five senses. In first grade, they learn about body parts of the systems and then when they get to second and third grade um, you know goes into a deeper dive on those systems with that so on the next slide there as you see this is kind of a breakdown of all of them K through 8 um, of how they all it's kind of hard to read hard to read from back here anyway um, but it shows how they interconnect together and how knowledge builds upon knowledge to help them develop that deeper understanding and when the um, ELA leads met um, a, a month or so ago, it was interesting to hear, you know, we have a teacher from each grade level, and they're talking about, oh, well, my kids learn this, and this, and this, and how, you know, there may be some basic systems, and then all of a sudden, in first grade, they're learning how many bones are in the body, and it, it just gets deeper and deeper. And so um, our knowledge keeps building, and we keep thinking that each year we, the kids have this, they'll know more about it when the teacher brings it up and talks about this, the kids will be like, oh yeah, well we learned about that in first grade or whatever. And some of our teachers even made connections to their kids um, in middle school and high school of the same topics that they may be learning about in biology or whatever. And it just helps them recall it from their working memory too as you keep repeating it and you're going over it and going deeper into it year after year. And we created a short video, this also came from our ELA lead meeting um, when the teachers were talking about all the and they were also talking about like they'd be out to eat with grandparents or whatever and the kids were talking about oh my gosh I learned this and this and this at school today and so we wanted to share some of the things our kids have learned in their knowledge <coughs> in class. Charles, can you tell us something about one of them? 
The more you know about a topic, uh, so we don't have the second graders read about, forget, I just wanted to have you guys read about that, but the more you know about a topic, the easier it is to read a text, to understand and retain, it, retain information. So as we build our knowledge block, um, we just think that we're going to have kids, students who have, they're going to have a lot of information about a variety of topics, we'll, which will hopefully help them um, read and comprehend things throughout their whole life. When they're talking about Athens and Sparta, that's not in social studies. That's in. Like, As you notice, I mean, like when you look at the one chart, that graphic organizing there, there's a lot of science and reading involved in that, like the body systems for science. And then there's, I think it starts off with the colonial towns with kindergarten, it builds up then all the way through. Um, so I think a lot of that is involved in, or in, included in our CKLA knowledge portions. 
I mean, are the science and social studies curriculum tied into this too to reinforce, and or is that completely separate? Right now, it's just it's separate. It's separate um, right now. Yeah, like in fourth grade, they're learning about um, well, they're finishing a poetry unit in CKLA, and um, they're learning about energy in science. So they aren't completely connected. But we're hoping that like the animal classification unit in third grade, um, then they do a science unit on animals later down the road, though. Because it kind of reminds me, you know, 50 years ago when I was in college and thematic units was mm -hmm. the big thing, you know, and just kind of immerse in a topic and do all your, you know. They learn a lot and they remember yeah, a, a lot, lot of all those yeah. things that they learn. It's pretty amazing. I learned about the inner ear the other night. Yes. <laughs> diagram. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one thing we want to do is to find a good way for um, families to talk to their students about like what you know like tell me something you learned today and then if they tell you the three parts of the ear or something like that more than just like how was school today right. or whatever because I think sometimes they can go home and talk about Ray Charles for 10 minutes and it's like a little kindergartner or telling about Jane Goodall things like that that as a parent, you may not know to ask those questions. So we wanna, and we send home um, like unit overview letters or whatever that kind of tells what they're learning about. But I think sometimes that's a challenge for parents and the kids have a lot to tell if you kind of ask them the right questions. Thank you guys. Well, thank you for your time today. Thank you. All right, um, we'll continue on then with, uh, what's our next? Old business, uh, second reading of board policies. <coughs> the, so this is the second reading. Um, we reviewed these in um, October as well. Uh, the district does not have policy 405-8, which is the licensed employee uh, evaluation. Uh, we do have legal requirements. That's <laughs> Uh, but we also need this as a board policy, so we want to uh, uh, recommend this or adopt um, the Iowa IASB recommended policy to, to match what we have in our uh, procedures and uh, collective bargaining agreement. Um, 4082, license employee publication, um, just right there, or creation material. <coughs> 4083, license employee tutoring are also being re re reviewed. What we have currently matches um, the ISB recommendations. So this is the second reading. So we will need um, a motion on this today. I feel that they're beneficial policies, and I'll make a motion to approve them. Thank you, Jay. Do we have a second? Second. Thanks, Andrea. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Second reading approved. All right, new business. Uh, looking at first reading of a policy. First reading, so there, you know, there's a more in this uh, November. Um, there we go. Uh, November fall policy updates. Uh, these are all updates that are uh, from the uh, IASB primer update. Uh, the first changes in policy 4011 uh, equal opportunity, uh, equal, equal employment opportunity. It's an update to the. A paragraph graph involving background checks. It also updates the equal employment opportunity address and contact, um, both which are required uh, by a lot of part of the policy. Second uh, change is in 5031 uh, student conduct, 5031 R1 student conduct. We don't have R1, so this this needs to be uh, adopted. Um, it's a new addition that includes a probation, in-school suspension, out-of-school suspension, and suspension of a special education student. Again, it uh, does reflect our practice, uh, just not something that we have in our policy that needs to be. And then the final piece is um, model policy for discipline, 50308R1. So this, this was, um, if you remember, there's a link to it in your in general, when we approved the handbooks, I talked about uh, we would need to make an a, amendment to our, our handbooks, uh, and that's because there was legislation that was passed last legislative session that said every district had to have this type of policy, um, discipline policy, and the Department of Ed would offer a model of that. And we just received that model, and then we went through it um, as an administrative team 
uh, and this is what we have come up. So the, in blue are the parts that you have to have in your policy. You have to have this defined threat of violence, and then this is the definition they gave us. That you have to have um, this defined incident of violence, defined injury, defined property dam damage, and defined assault. And then what the legislative piece was is that there has to be an escalated response. Um, and it has to be by grade level. So it's pre-K 2, 3, 5, uh, 6, 8, and high school. These are minimums, because you'll see lots of may. You know, so a, um, a kindergarten student has a behavior incident. Um, th these are minimums that we would um, contact parent or guardian. Um, that we, we may um, ask for a conference with that parent or guardian and so on. So it, it just, um, it grows from the first level to the second level to the third level. Uh, and that, that is what had to be part of the policy. I do believe this policy reflects our practice. I, you know, this is what our, our administrators do at all levels. Um, but it now has to be part of our board policy and it has to be part of all of our handbooks. Um, this is the first reading of this, so there's nothing to do with this tonight, um, just like the other first readings, um, but we can, we can bring it back and um, approve it in, in December. All right, any questions? Okay, please review those and we'll bring it back and look at it in December. Um, approved sharing agreements in the girl, with girls wrestling. We've had three schools, uh, Bishop Garrigan, North Union, North Iowa, inquire about sharing girls wrestling. Uh, we had sharing agreements with both North Union and North Iowa last year with kids who participated for us. Um, Bishop Garrigan um, is, is the addition. Currently there are not any classifications in high school wrestling. That's always something to consider in a sharing agreement. Will sharing change our class? Um, but there aren't classifications currently in high school girls wrestling. So I would recommend um, $200 a wrestler and then they provide their transportation uh, to Algona High School. But that $200, that is what our agreement was last year with North Iowa and yeah. North Union. As well. How does this affect, so I get it's important to share, but I I'm not a huge fan of sharing when it takes away opportunities from our girls. Yeah. And so there's a lot of schools that don't have full teams like we do. We have the luxury of having a very big team right now. And yeah. I've been at matches where not every girl's getting to wrestle. Yeah. You know, so now we're bringing in kids from other schools that are, our girls aren't getting to wrestle. So, I mean, I. Yeah, I think, Grant, I think that's a really mm -hmm. good um, point to bring up. Um, we want, um, you know, we want to help other districts and, and have have experiences that, that are good for their kids and ours. Um, I think when it, but not at the cost of our when kids. Our, when our students lose an opportunity, it's something to consider. Um, our girls wrestling team last year, you know, first year of a sanctioned girls wrestling team, uh, we we wouldn't have had a full lineup without, and and didn't have a full lineup even with uh, some kids. From from North Union and North Iowa. I, I don't know about our lineup this year, um, but there's there's a lot of kids. We have, we have 20 some girls for 14 spots. So I'm, I'm sure there's some competition for some of <coughs> spots. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I just, I, I'm hesitant because I don't know, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. but I just don't, you know, I don't I, know. I, I mean, I get it. I definitely see the benefit for those schools. What's the benefit for Algona schools? Bigger team, camaraderie, you know, full lineup, you know. It's a yeah, full lineup if you weren't able to have one. Um, those girls have the opportunity if they chose to earlier open a roll in to wrestle or district or not? Yeah, you know, there's no there's no deadlines for open enrollment. Um, there is still the 90 days of non-varsity competition. Okay. That, can't that be waived in both districts? It can be. Yes, it can be. Does this increase our classification? No. Uh, in girls wrestling, currently there is not classification, so it doesn't. All right. Otherwise told by wrestling coaches, if they could have more kids in the practice room, it gave more kids a chance to wrestle off against other kids, mm -hmm. and not a 110-pounder versus a 100 70 pounder in the room. So 
know, more kids have an advantage too for making our kids stronger. Th this is something that um, you know, we, we started to have this discussion last year, I think, for discussing some sharing agreements. And I went to Mr. Jacobson and to our head wrestling coaches, and um, all three of them certainly would be in favor of these agreements. And I think that certainly is a factor in that time. Um, more kids, the room is better. You know, the competition is better, the practice is better. That's good to know, too. I just think it needs to be looked at as the program grows. I, just because we do it one year doesn't mean that we need to do it every year. Sure. They can't count on it because it's just. Yeah. Do we do it in boys? We do do it in boys. With we There's Garrigan kids that Yeah, we come have a sharing agreement with Garrigan also. And it's, you know, it hasn't been a huge deal, but I think it is going to affect. I mean, I, I'll be honest. I don't, I mean, I, Algona's Algona's the public school. Like, if you're here, you're here, you know. And so, like, you know, if you start to have competition is good and that, but, I mean, it's a, you know, say you start to have four or five Garrigan kids that are in the starting lineup for the varsity, and then you have two Algona kids behind them, you know, that are, have worked and do it. It's just there's not a spot for them. Is that fair to the Algona kids? I don't know. Yeah, you know? when I talked to our wrestling coaches about this previously, um, one of the points they mentioned was in our youth programs, there, there's just one youth program, mm -hmm. no matter what school you go to. Uh, so in our, in our wrestling coaches' eyes, they're, they're all coming through that youth program and they're all in our high school program, again, regardless of what high school, which was a a good perspective to get from them. That's how they look at it. But but I think you're right. And I think it is certainly valuable to look at on a year to year basis. Yeah, if you want to be here in Algona, be here in Algona. So we don't get to pick and choose. What's that? We don't necessarily get to pick and choose what sports we're gonna participate with which school. Yeah. So I'll just say I think it's good to monitor every year. Um, Maybe we're still young and are you know starting enough with the girls wrestling that it's still valuable to do it. But let's definitely keep an eye on it or keep a, listen to our coaches and yeah. and see where we are. So I guess we're first we need a motion then if we want to move forward to approve these um, assuring agreements. I mean I'll make a motion. I think it's you trust the coaches, but I think at the end of the day I think we need to revisit it each year and do what's best for the Algona kids mm -hmm. in our district. Yeah. So if it's if we look at the program and we have three Algona girls that are not getting to participate and get matches, I mean I'm not even talking about varsity level and competition. I mean there's just there's just not sometimes enough matches. I mean kids are going to meets and there's not even they don't get to wrestle. They don't get to participate at all because there's you know other kids. That's what I'm worried about. So I don't know enough about it, but I think it needs to be talked about quite a bit in the future as we look at these agreements as things grow, okay. boys and girls, and any sport that we do. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thanks, Dad. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion for approved for the sharing agreements. Uh, teacher associate substitute rates. I, I would propose increasing the teacher associate substitute rate. Um, it, it previously was um, ten dollars and forty cents, uh, that which was lower than what our hiring rate was. And if you remember, we increased our hiring rate during the school year last year to thirteen. So I, I would make a proposal to increase the uh, teacher associate sub rate. To 11.15, or you could consider raising it to 13, uh, which is what our hiring rate is for teacher associates. I, I think you know, 10.40 is too low. 11.15 is too low. Um, you know, the, these these are difficult positions to get. It's difficult to get people to sub uh, for teacher associates or teachers. Um, and anything we can do to make that situation easier, I think, is valuable for our kids. Surprised we even have teachers associate subs. <laughs> I, I think the, the great people that we have that do it 
um, they they like to be around our kids and they'd like to help out our kids and we're I think we're lucky to have them and things feel like they'd be working somewhere else or you know hard to find people just that aren't working and available to stuff like that right so yeah and you look at what is available for 11 15 or 13 dollars now <laughs> in the community and that kind of stuff and you can only imagine some of the challenges in getting these folks in and then what you know what they have to contend with so if I'm reading this right Joe you you would uh, recommend going as high as 13 at this point all right, I'd make a motion to um, change our teacher associate substitute rate uh, to $13 an hour. I'll second that. And this would begin immediately? I mean, or? Yeah. Yes. That, okay. All right, we have a motion and a second to raise the teacher associate sub rate to $13 an hour. Any further discussion? Any idea how much this costs total for the district? Very small. Yeah. yeah. Less than 10000 a year. Well, and we're looking at, you're basically, you know, not the full 13, we're looking at about 250 increase. You know, we're already paying 1040. Yeah, yeah. yeah but I mean, just. Yeah. So. All right, uh, any further discussion? Hearing none then, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries to raise the rate to 13 an hour. Um, Okay, the next ones we're going to be talking a little bit about resolutions, and you'll see in your packet also that there are some green. Yeah. Uh, the motions will need to, once we discuss them, will need to re, uh, be read that way. Uh, and then we also will have roll calls with each one. So there's there's three resolutions, which we'll all do separately. Uh, the, these all involve the field house project. Uh, they're resolutions um, for the, the 19, uh, 19 of school infrastructure sales service and use of tax revenue. So the first resolution is appointing UMB Bank of Des Moines as the paying agent between the district and Iowa State Bank. Um, the resolution, as Rodney said, is, is there in green uh, to approve UMB as the paying agent between the two. I make a motion to approve the resolution between paying agent bond register and transfer agent agreement and authorizing the execution of the same. I have no idea what I just said. <laughs> sort of was that like the cricket thing we read? <laughs> I feel a little uh, bit like that. Thank you. Uh, we do have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thanks, Todd. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Lisa will do a roll call for us. Davis? Yes. Memba? Yes. Zawaji? Yes. You did? <coughs> yes. Owen? Yes. Yes. So when we, we did these, uh, Lisa and I were putting this stuff together, you know, I would read the same thing, Andrew, and I'm like, I, I got to put this in simple words. So my, my words are the black ones. The green come from our, our lawyers. But we so. got to say the green, right? Yeah, we got to say the green. make sure. So the second resolution <coughs> is the approval of our tax exempt certificate. That is sim that's a simple one. It's simply approving our tax exemption as a public school district. Make the motion of approval of the tax exemption certificate. Thanks, Jay. Do we have a second? Second the motion. Thanks, Tom. We have a motion to second. Any further discussion? Ready for roll call, then. Davis? Yes. Limba? Yes. Mwanji? Yes. Nugent? Yes. Owen? Yes. Dinsey? Yes. And then our third one. The third <coughs> one is approving the use of sales tax dollars for this project. Anytime to use sales tax dollars um, in a project you have to get uh, a resolution to do we're, we're not approving the field house anything this is just that was already done. no no yeah. but we're saying we're we're preparing it if we like the bids to have the funds yep. available yep. To do. Okay. all right we do need a someone to uh, motion the resolution as written I do a resolution authorizing the terms of issuance and providing for and securing the payment Skill infrastructure, sales, services, and use. Thanks, Tom. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thanks, Todd. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we're ready for roll call. Davis? Yes. Limba? Yes. Lodging? Yes. Nugent? Yes. Owen? Yes. Vincent? Yes. All right. Uh, motion approved. Resolution approved.
All right, we're going into maybe something. Uh, the Ella Thompson <coughs> yeah. trial was almost kind of a history history lesson with this too. So the, the Thompson Scholarship Fund um, was established in 1955 by William uh, Thompson of La Jolla, California. Uh, the beneficiary of the trust is out going to high school and has been since 1955. Uh, part of the trust agreement says that the money will always be in a national bank. In 1955, that was a really big deal, right? So, um, we, we've continued to honor uh, Mr. Thompson's um, uh, will to the letter and plan to continue to. Uh, most recently, the money has been in uh, with Bank of America um, out, out of Chicago, um, which recently got out of the trust business. Uh, so. Bank of America has worked with us to find um, the American National Bank of Texas as a replacement. So per the um, will of William E. Thompson of 1955, the trust agreement says that only the Algona Community School Board can approve a successor trustee. So that's what we're doing tonight. We are approving uh, the American National Bank of Texas as now the trustee of the Thompson Fund. Why? Did they want it in a national bank? I'm sure it had to do with um, <coughs> securing of funds. You know, that would be you know, before the FDIC is what it is now. Um, so if we wanted it to be a local bank? Um, it would go against our the original will of William E. Thompson. But that was before there was FDIC? Yep. And, and we, we've we had our lawyers look at this. They recommend continuing with the, as it's written. <laughs> How many million dollars is it now? Uh, yes. About three hundred. Yes. It 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 gives out almost three hundred thousand a year to our graduates. The Thompson Fund is our um, entirely needs based scholarship, yep. okay. um, which usually has three tiers to it. Um, there could be 20, 20 students. Receive this, not more than that, probably. Maybe yeah, almost more. Usually more than that. Yeah. So it's a tremendous um, scholarship that was established by Mr. Thompson and his wife, and um, you know, a great piece that the district's able to have for the kids. This is completely separate from the foundation. It is completely separate from the foundation, which is why I put in there that in the original um, will, Algona Community Schools, uh, 1955, would have been pre. Foundation now it probably would be part of the foundation, but we've we've continued to honor as it was written in 1950. I'll motion to approve. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. Do we have a second? I'll second, second that motion. Thanks, Tom. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. I should ask, but like, is there a cost for these banks to manage a trust like this? Um, they. Yeah, I'm sure there, there's some expenses to it. There would be in any, all of our, um, the foundation stuff all has cost with it, you know, expenses with it as well. Yeah. I mean, it would just be nice for our local banks to have. Mm -hmm. could, could we put it in front of a judge to have uh, it probably. modified yeah. if we wanted to? If, yeah. I mean, if this gentleman was that generous to do this, like it wouldn't be out of, I mean, he just did it the best way that he thought it did with his right. lawyers at the time to yeah. have secure funds, right? But now mm -hmm. if it's FDIC insured and our banks are here in town. It'd be nice to have it here instead of Texas, yeah. right? Yeah. But I'd have to I split mean, it up in a few, I don't know, if one bank do it all or not, I don't know. Uh, something to think. That's up, I don't know. Pretty good. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. All of our foundation steps in one place, right? Okay. It would just be something to ask. Yeah. But I mean, if our lawyers yeah. say do it, it's not that big a deal, but yeah. is there anybody from the family that's left? I don't think we've been in contact with the family for some time. Um, my knowledge of it came from um, some, some members of the foundation who really um, kind of reviewed it annually, because that, you know, that's what we do. Meet with Bank of America, review you know, how, how it's working and where the dollars are. Um, that's that's how I learned of all that. Then I got the will this year to, to read it, um, what it actually says. All right.
right. Um, open enrollment. We'll move on. Finish out. Yeah. We have one, one open enrollment. Um, this this student has met all uh, guidelines uh, for approval. Motion to approve the open enrollment. Okay. Second. Thank you. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Open enroll approved. Uh, contracts. Contracts. We have a number of, of contracts. Brent Owen, Volunteer High School Girls Wrestling. So Brian that's supposed Morgan. to that's supposed to be high school and middle school. So high okay. School and middle school girls wrestling. Okay. Um, Brian Morgan, Volunteer High School Middle School Boys Wrestling. Uh, Jeremy Rummel, Volunteer High School. Volunteer Middle School Boys Wrestling, Jay Bustrom, Volunteer High School Boys Wrestling, Corey Bustrom, Volunteer High School Boys Wrestling, Chad Slagle, Volunteer High School Boys Wrestling, Cole Johnson as our middle school boys wrestling coach, Adriana Posey as, our middle, as a middle school teacher associate, Trevor Arnold as freshman boys basketball, Blair Bradley was being reassigned for one year. His reassignment is now in seventh grade boys basketball for one year only. Cameron Rendoni, volunteer high school boys basketball, and Paul Jorgensen as a bus driver. We had a bus driver resignation early in the school year, really before the school year started, and we've covered that route with substitutes up to this point. Uh, and Jordan Limbaugh, high school wrestling coach. I move to approve all the contracts. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Alexandria, uh, motion and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the contracts say aye. 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 Opposed? Contracts approved. Thank you, everyone. I think the meeting, a lot of good discussion tonight, and something for us to think about moving forward with the UO. Uh, need a motion for adjournment. Motion to adjourn. Thank you. We're second. So moved. Yeah, we are adjourned then. Thank you. Is that you then?